The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IA exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMD's Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This episode is proudly brought to you by NetWealth. For over 21 years, NetWealth has provided market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help wealth businesses thrive. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important to embrace new technology to enhance the way you run your business. With change comes your chance to use advanced technology, reshape your client experience, and see wealth differently. Visit the website to learn how NetWealth can support your advice and wealth business. Hello, and welcome to the XY Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and this week we're going to deep dive into Facebook. And joining me here today to help me out is a Northern Territorian, a technologist, how cool a title is that, a daily sunrise watcher, a fellow story brand fan, and a lead trainer for Facebook. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Dante St. James. Woo! Thank Welcome. you so much. That was quite an introduction. I love the word technologist because it can mean anything. Absolutely. It it's just sounds really smart. Saying, <laughs> it's my way of saying I'm a geek, really, but without <laughs> saying the word geek. Yeah. We've we've moved past that, haven't we? We're, we're better we than geeks. Geek yeah. and nerd have really bad connotations if you really know where those two terms come from. Yeah. And we've kind of, as, as geeks and nerds, we've, we've kind of owned those names over, over a period of time. I like the word technologist and it kind of describes that, that, that length and breadth of background where you, those of us who have been through many iterations of what technology is tend to think of ourselves as actually we're, we're technologists, not just yeah. geeks and nerds. We actually have a, uh, we have a, a finger in the pie. We have um, skin in the game. Yeah, we sort of got a bent towards those things and learn how to adjust, right? Because that's a lot of what dealing with technology is. Oh, another change, pivot. Oh, another change, pivot again. You know, I mean, it's, and I'm sure for the listener, they're the same. I mean, it's, it's a little relentless, to be honest. So it is something you've got to sort of step into and, and own that you're going to have to get on top of for sure. Now, I'm keen to dive into all things Facebook and pick your brain. For me personally, if for no other other reason, and the listeners can come along for the ride. But before we do that, I wanted to get to know you a little better through your use of technology. What is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? I do in a limited way. So okay. I'm, not, I'm not a fan of, of overuse of emojis. I find they, they confuse the reading rather than clarify it. Okay. Uh, but a, a good emoji can help to explain things like sarcasm. It can explain things like, uh, yeah, when you, when you're being funny, when you're actually making a joke, whereas yeah. the joke may land flat if it's just in text, but with an emoji, the laugh to your cry emoji, which is my favorite one, yeah. uh, is, is the one that really helps someone understand. Oh, that was a joke. Okay. I get that. And they can read it in the spirit that it was that it was written rather than having to fill in the gaps themselves and for those who may not uh, take social cues as well as others yep. particularly in the written format which is very hard to explain i think You'd remember a while ago there was a push for an emoji uh, for sarcasm, a sarcasm yeah. uh, pu- pu- punctuation mark, yeah. and it was you know, it never really got anywhere. But it was such a great idea because sarcasm can be read as really nasty sometimes when really it's just someone poking fun often at themselves. Yeah, hundred percent. And I love that. Um, I even encourage the team with emails to clients. Like a single emoji can set a tone. Like it's just giving them the, is it a light tone? Is it a serious tone? Like it just lets it sort of really establish because you're right. We all read words with our own 
perspective and our own baggage and our own soundtrack to that. So, That's yeah, right. I'm with you. The single use of emoji is very powerful. I'm like, I use that one a lot too, I've got to say. Um, how about if you had to delete everything off all the apps off your phone and just keep three? Which ones would you keep? I'd keep LinkedIn because that's uh, where I do so much of my business. So yep. definitely would keep keep that one. Um, the other ones that really, probably Facebook Messenger I keep because that's where I chat to my mum most of all. <laughs> and so that's that's it's it's somewhere where I've actually trained other people to use that app. Uh, and the final one I probably use is oh, I'd have to be one of the streaming services because I, I I use all my streaming is done via my phone to my television. So if I'd say the one that I watch the most, it'd have to be YouTube. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, I like it. And Facebook Messenger, I'm going to put a little pin in that because I'm going to ask you about that later because I'm sure mm. you've got some perspective on that, even from a, a business or a professional perspective. But let's let's sort of dive in. Now, I have been, um, since we sort of connected for you coming on the show, um, I've been sort of watching a whole lot of your content and subscribers and I'm getting some real value out of it. And I noticed a post you recently made that said, we sort of seem to have forgotten what Facebook actually is and what its purpose is. What did you mean by that? Mm, so it's the assumption as, as a small business owner myself and, and yourself being one and so many of the people we deal with being small business owners, we often forget that Facebook is not a business platform. It wasn't made for businesses. Right. It wasn't made for us. It was made for people to connect as individuals. So I, I told a, like a quite a, a, a passionate story about um, the reuniting of my father and his brother after more than 20 years of being estranged from each other after a, you know, one of those typical family breakdowns over an estate of grandparents. Horrible story, really nasty how it ended out, but they, they, they finally did reconnect after 20 years. And it was just a beautiful story that came out of, uh, relationships born on Facebook, me right. connecting with cousins that I hadn't seen in 23 years, all that kind of stuff. And so that, that's when you put a story like that up there and, and the millions of other stories about connection, reconnection, school reunions, um, communities coming together in disasters, uh, mums connecting with each other in order to be able to, you know, be able to get kids to school or babysat. Putting then uh, uh, your your local fifty percent off offer at the local <laughs> takeaway shop kind of pales into insignificance with that, and that's what yeah. really shows us that, that that Facebook is not a place for businesses. Really, it's just kind of been Frankensteined on to a platform that's connected for people to then be able to get something that that appeals to businesses as well. But we tend to, as small businesses, rant and rave and stomp and jump up and down when you know we don't have fifty thousand people seeing our latest offer or our latest special coming up for them to um, to to see and take advantage of. We forget that businesses are largely boring. <laughs> to the average person that we're, we're such an infinitesimally small part of their lives. Yeah. But because it's a big part of our lives, we expect that everybody should see the business and the importance of that business the way that we do. Yeah, absolutely. And it is to that point, it is a danger that I've, I've realized in myself when years ago, if you, um, did a presentation or you had some thought leadership or anything like that, you'd put effort into it, you presented, and then you might get some actual feedback, like people actually talking to you or even some email feedback, and you'd sort of, oh, good, and then you'd iterate and you'd do it again. Whereas now, you know, you stare at that post waiting <laughs> for a like or a comment or like the, we're just, we're a bit messed up. I think, I think we sort of missed the point. And to, you know, what you're saying there is if, if the lens you're using, with social media or particularly Facebook isn't connection, it's probably not going to work, you know, because it's just not what people want to be there for. That's what we're seeing right now on Facebook is yeah, we had okay. we had these initial halcyon days where the business platform was sort of um, bolted onto it and there was this immediate um, massive of, 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 of posts coming in from businesses. What we don't realize that while we as businesses thought that was amazing that we're getting so much, so much uh, exposure out there, it was hell for the people on the platform who weren't businesses because they were seeing nothing but ads. What they saw was ads coming through and flooding their feed. So it wasn't long before Facebook, about a year after that happened, that Facebook had to really throttle that back because the users were in an uproar about basically, all I'm seeing is these businesses. I want to see 
interesting things, fun things, not, you know, buy one, get one free offers from the local, you know, shoe dispensary. It's, it yeah. wasn't really what people were on there for. So that the, the halcyon days that businesses tend to refer back to were a very short lived period of time where we basically had free run of a platform that we weren't paying for. That we had no real right being there and we really had no idea what we were doing with it anyway. <laughs> No, for sure. And so, how do you th- how do you see that? And of course, your lens is, you know, got an expert basis there. How do you see that differing, say, to Instagram or TikTok in terms of? I mean, I see a lot on Instagram. Say, I haven't yet really dove into t- TikTok. I see like a lot of it secondhand. You know, it'll be shared on another platform. I haven't actually braved myself to go in, and I'm sure I should. But um, on Instagram, I can see people trying to do the connection thing, but it feels like actually that's not what the platform really is for anyway. And so maybe we're forcing something on one platform. We should be, you know, shifting our the the technique to back to Facebook for connection and Instagram something else. Is that valid? Mm, very valid. In fact, there's uh, there's there's a very big noticeable change happening in social media now. Once upon a time, there was social networks and there was media, um, and then at some point, those things were c- c- collapsed together to become this thing called social media. What we're starting to see now, particular and TikTok can really be sort of given the credit for taking the lead here. They've taken the media side taken it back out of social media again and it's become what we call creator media. Now, Instagram probably started that that trend where mm. there was a, a tendency to create influencers and content that, that attracted a lot of people in to interact with it, but it wasn't social networking. And Instagram is not really a social network. It's more of a, a creator platform where creators right. go in, create um, content that attracts people. But when you look at it, they might have 50,000 followers, but they've only got two or three comments. So the actual social part of it is not really getting that far. Um, the same with, with TikTok. You might say, Oh, yes, 1.5 million people saw this, but only 36 people actually commented on it. Yeah. So you're seeing there's lots of media consumption happening, but no social networking. Flip back to Facebook. What we'll see is there's, Lots of people, when I post in my own profile to people who are, are not following me, but are a part of my life in some way, shape or form, I'll post something funny and I'll get 28 comments and, you know, 112 likes and all that. I go to my business page and I'm lucky to get 36 people seeing it because yeah. what I'm doing personally to the people who I actually know, who know me, they understand my sense of humor. They will respond to that because, oh, that's so Dante. Yeah. But then I go and try and do something on a business page. And whilst I might have 1,500, 2,000 people following me on that business page, they're not really on Facebook to be following a business. They're there to be following friends, family, seeing the babies, seeing the grandkids, seeing the, you know, joining with other people in their local network to be able to, you know, find um, a good deal on a secondhand dresser, that sort yeah. of thing. That's not, they're not there to interact with my business. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Well, I think that's really helpful. So listening today, we'll have a combination of maybe salaried staff, you know, so advisors or or support staff that are salaried. Then we'll have, you know, practice owners, business owners, and even people as a bit like me. I put myself sort of almost in the wannabe content creators, speakers, you know, which is another sort of category almost um, on its own. So I guess I wanted to then talk about each of that user and for you, um, you know, how do they approach it differently? So it's, it's interesting. And I'd love to start with the salaried staff member because I think mentally a lot of people in these roles think they can't, um, be themselves professionally on social media. Like they, do you know what I mean? Like, a, well, that's just a tool that I catch up with my mates and, and that's valid based on what you're saying. That's completely valid. But I'm curious to hear what you would say to somebody like that about, about the way they could utilize Facebook in terms of maybe clarifying, you know, who they are professionally and people getting to know them better in that context. This is such a timely question. So, I'm just before I came into this into this uh, session, um, I'm actually in the middle of writing a blog post about the four things you should never post on social media, oh. and, and it's around that whole idea of um of, of say salaried employees who mm. are you know afraid to post anything on social media for fear that it'll be read a certain way, and we see this really commonly on LinkedIn, where you know while someone may be more than willing to post the photos of the, the zucchini they're growing in their garden or the sunset that they saw on the way home last night or their holiday to Bali and they feel completely comfortable doing that in a very public realm like Facebook, when it comes over to something like LinkedIn, they look at that and go, 
if I've got to post something which is absolutely perfect, because if it's not perfect and it's not completely fact checked and not completely, you know, um, spot on in every single way, everybody who I know is going to judge me. My entire workplace will judge me. In fact, if I post something on on Instagram, I'm oh, sorry, on LinkedIn uh, today, my entire all the people I work with here in this organization are going to look at me and go, who the hell do you think you are? Right. Who are you to be posting this kind of thing? So yeah. this is the whole conversation that goes on inside everyone's head every time they go, I want to step out and do something on, particularly on LinkedIn. Yeah. There's, a, there's a real stigma to that. In fact, um, you know, 70, I think it's something like uh, 57% of all people on Facebook post regularly on Facebook. That's less than 1% on LinkedIn. So of yeah, the 900 okay. million or so people on LinkedIn, we've only got perhaps, you know, you know, so few people are actually posting anything because of that stigma that comes with posting to your peers, to your network, to your workmates. Yeah. And it's, it's so true. And what's interesting is if you can, on something like LinkedIn, if you can post with, and I'd say authenticity is such an overused word. Let's use sincerity. So it's sincere. Um, and, and a bit exposed, it actually gets far more traction because it's real. Like, and people are like, yes, that's exactly how I feel. You know, like it's, <laughs> it, that's the thing that people are commenting on and tagging other people. And because it's once again creating that, and, and to be honest, it's making us all feel a bit more normal. You know, and I think that's the thing that LinkedIn, we've, we all, we all treat it like it's the most awkward networking event we've ever been to. Like that's that's sort of what it can feel like sometimes, right? Because we all suit up and we get serious and it's professional and it's, you know, and it's all brandy. So I think I take your point in that sense um, that there's more to do uh, for lots of people on LinkedIn. Flipping that, if somebody's in a role, what do you think would be some subtle ways they could be posting on Facebook that bring a tone of, and it doesn't even need to be their job. I guess it's just about, what they love about their work or what they, they enjoy about their industry or even what frustrates them. Is there a way you think people can approach that better? There's neutral topics you can you get in there that don't necessarily put forward an opinion. I think it's the opinion part that people can often get okay. a little bit scared of because yep. what if I post an opinion that then I get a pile on of people who are just going, that's not true, that's not right, I disagree, and it's like they freeze and go, what have I done? Yeah. What we yeah. want to do is, is, is look for those neutral topics that inform or entertain or somehow educate people on yeah. on something that they otherwise wouldn't know. So if you're in a practice and you're a salaried employee and you want to post insights that have come from an industry report where you're saying interesting insights that have come up this week from a study uh, by KPMG into this. And they're not necessarily adding their opinion to it, but they're presenting it. Yeah. as a trusted source of information. So not just that KPMG report being trusted source of information, but the employee themselves becomes a trusted source of information. Yeah. Okay. Now, this sort of sharing of stuff is not going to set the world on fire. It's not sure. going to attract hundreds and hundreds of comments. But what it does, it does position you as somebody who traffics in good information, yeah. traffics in well-researched pieces, that things that are worth sharing that may not be the most attention-grabbing stuff, but it still has credibility. It's authentic in that you are presenting it and you, you're adding maybe your words on it where you may point to and say, um, particularly look at point uh, point 3A, where I think it really impacts on the, on the market within Southeast Queensland. And then you can go forward and, and present something which customizes it somehow for your audience neutral approach, no no opinions in there, but you're localizing it or somehow personalizing it down to the people that you would do want to reach. I think that's probably the first place to go and find some sort of content. Yeah. So that's interesting. So that's a sort of um, almost curating or translating. I mean, I was just thinking that one angle you could take is, is you know, you might be a, a junior advisor out there and, and oh, hey, there's this thing that came out of the industry. You could, you could do a post that's sort of along the lines of, you know, if I, how would I walk my grand through the recent industry report on? Like making it, because you're in a human platform, it's about connection. So you need to create connection for your reader or your audience to this awkward potentially dull and confusing thing that you're telling them about. So sort of humanizing Curating. it is probably important. 
that the word you call curating that's the perfect it's exactly what i'm saying it's taking some confusing often um it may seem irrelevant information to some people and making it relevant and less confusing you're um almost like a pundit you're taking a piece yeah. of complex information and bringing it down to a level where somebody in the industry who doesn't understand the intricacies of the terminology or the jargon can work with that nice and easily yeah, lovely. That's really helpful. So then <clears throat> if we flip that to business owner, let's call them slash thought leader. If you're starting, you know, if you're a business owner, you're starting, you're posting on, on social media anywhere, really, then you've got to sort of consider yourself as putting forward views. I guess that that's when there is some opinion I would, I would expect would start to filter through. Is that fair in a different sort of, that's the different angle that most business owners would take? A thought leader can't be a thought leader without having thoughts. So <laughs> exactly. it, it, it kind of comes with the territory. And I had someone throw to me uh, recently calling me a thought leader. And I thought, well, actually, it might be kind of true because I am leading a following of people down a certain path. Yeah. Um, when it comes to that kind of thought leadership stuff as a business owner or someone who is looking to develop a personal brand of sorts, right. or they want to be someone, you know, uh, what, what we like to call a, um, a key person of influence then you're working with two kinds of very different uh, content. There's what we call the obvious content, which is stuff like um, we these days we work too many hours and it's taking us away from our families and I think that's a bad thing. And right. that's obvious. Who's going to disagree with that? Like yeah. no one's going to disagree with that. Or something like um, kids these days eat too much junk food and it's time to return to good wholesome food like we had when we were growing up. Mind you, there was no wholesome food. There was no. kind of pies, sausage rolls, and sunny boy ice blocks. So, but, you know, we've got a romanticized, you know, nostalgia about the way we grew up. And if you're doing that, no one's going to disagree that kids should be he eating healthy food. That's yeah. what I call obvious content. It's easy to agree with. No one's going to disagree. The very agreeable platform that LinkedIn is or the, the Facebook is will come back and say, yeah, yeah, that's great. We should go back to these old values. Then there's what I call the not so obvious content. And that's the, the the content which says, okay, I'm going to make a point of view here that may also be unpopular. So right. it might be the thing is like the concept of work life balance is a, is a scam, and here's why. Right. I explained that basically work life balance is based around people who can afford work life balance, who work for government jobs, which work from you know like nine a.m. to to four twenty one p.m. <laughs> and they get fifteen thousand days of annual leave and another yeah. thirty two thousand days of flexi days, and they've got this structure in their lives which supports the concept of work-life balance. They have 30 people who can back them up when they go on leave. For me, as a solopreneur, as a, as a, as a small business owner of my, of my own business, now down to a company one, I don't have those luxuries. So no. I have to go, well, work-life balance is a complete scam to me because it, it's utterly irrelevant. What yep. I would have instead is maybe what we call a blend. So there's times when my work and my life do overlap with each other. I get the advantages of that, which means flexible working arrangements, flexible working hours, but I get the disadvantages of that, which means that sometimes on a Sunday, I'm going to have to pull out the, the computer and write a blog post. Yeah. Well, I can, you know, that's an hour of my life. I'm sure I'm going to be okay with that. So, th so when you take that not so obvious, the more thoughtful approach to content where it's, um, it, it's, Speaking often from your lived experience, that's the not so obvious content. The, the, it's, it's got insight to it. It's got thought to it. It's saying this to say, well, yes, while it might be right for some people, it's not right for others. So that's where you, you have thought to lead with yeah. rather than just repeating and regurgitating the same platitudes and the same, you know, um, work hard and, 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 and one day your dreams will come true. That's obvious content. Everyone wants to agree with that because we all want to believe that working hard leads to millions. But yeah. what people don't necessarily want to agree with and may find confronting is actually sometimes you can work hard and not get there. So here's a few things I've got which helped me to get there um, that may actually help you to get there too. Yeah. Okay. And so that's the sort of interesting element you you originally mentioned about Facebook, you know, fun or interesting. Um, and it's doing that. And I guess the extreme of that, which I think probably doesn't work is when somebody's just purely contrarian to get a reaction, which of course doesn't have that sincerity, does it? So it's got to have some sincerity to it. 
you can rattle people's cage a little, but it's got to come from a real place. Whereas, um, and you, we've all seen them, you know, where some people just will just say the opposite of whatever's going on. I'm like, really, what's the point? You're just trying to upset people now. <laughs> That's not. Yeah. It's value. like watching Parliament and watching the opposition. Exactly. Basically, they not necessarily come up with a with a policy of their own, but they'd just be contrarian because, well, what they said, we we don't agree with, and it's a default position. And that kind of person, if they don't balance it out with other useful content, say for instance something I can teach, something I can deliver as a list, something that I can, uh, something, an observation I've made in life, or here's a story of how I succeeded and here's how I got there. That kind of thing offsets those contrarian posts. You can't live on contrarian alone because no. it, it actually works against you in terms of um, the, the sentiment and analysis algorithms within both Facebook and, and LinkedIn. Contrarian tends to be negative and attracts negative. So if, if, if you're always posting that sort of stuff, your following will, will decrease, your, your, your reach will decrease. Facebook is like brutal with it. But, um, LinkedIn these days is actually quite good with it too. I knew that after having too many contrary posts of mine in, I think it was, uh, July, I had a massive dip in my, in my reach and I looked back and went, Oh, I did three contrarian posts that week. I was, a little, I was a little negative that week. Maybe I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to rest the negative for a couple of weeks, come back with some more uplifting and more inspirational stuff. And surely enough, the reach kind back up again. And now what I can do is have one contrarian post a week, which generally is my most followed and most reacted to thing, but not because it's contrary, but because it's, it stands out amongst all the other stuff that I'm doing. Yeah. And I guess that's a. That sort of leads into the next thing, which is is obvious, but I feel like most of us, and I'll put myself in this category too, just don't listen to ourselves. We know that when we're on something like Facebook, it irritates the living daylights out of us when it feels like it's ads, right? And I don't mean actual ads. I mean, there's actual ads and that's one thing. But then when somebody we know posts something that feels like an ad and we get irritated or we, or we skip it, right? Because we're also tra- trained to just ignore ads. I mean, we literally, I think our eyeballs sort of turn off, you know, <laughs> just go, no, not for me. So I'm imagining that something else that you'd, you'd sort of suggest is we, is almost, you know, too much polish is not necessarily a good thing. We all know that 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 friend of ours has suddenly joined a network marketing scheme, and and next thing they were like, for out of nowhere, all of a sudden they were like, "I'm working from home and being a boss mum, and it's to change my life, and here's why, and you can do it too," and you're like. Jennifer, last week you posted a photo of you drinking out of a goonie bag. Yeah. Like honestly, this this is not this is not who we we expected you to be. Like, yeah. who is this person? Yeah. And when it looks like it, it's con- it's it's contrived, when it doesn't feel natural, when it doesn't come from the heart, it doesn't come from a level of authenticity or sincerity, which is a great term for that. It doesn't seem sincere. It's not really you. It's going to look like an ad. And you're right. We we are trained ourselves from you know. 25 years of, of banner ads on websites, we ignore them. We don't even see them anymore. When asked if you, if you saw that Jetstar ad on the news.com.au website and you go, I mm, don't remember it because you literally have just filtered it. We've got a filter now. Yeah. Attention filters exist so heavily in that. That's why ads have had to become much more in your face. Um, and they're now disguised as content in the case of uh, TikTok, for instance. You cannot tell the difference between a TikTok and an ad, which will come against them. Actually, they're going to have issues with that with when it comes to um, consumer law coming up. Yeah. So they're not going to get away with it forever. Yeah. Uh, when you can't tell the difference between the two, when you're listening to the radio and you don't know when you've gone from an ad into a song or a song into a, into a presentation or a talk back segment and into an ad, there's problems there. That's That's got real issues. So mm-hmm. we as consumers now have taught ourselves how to filter out ads. So if our ads and our content are too close to each other, we then filter out all the content and we only yep. see the things which are clearly not ad related. And it and you've got to like really think about this, listeners, because I mean I'm thinking of those ads. I think they're generally about products in like pharmacies and things, you know, when they're talking about to and they pretend I'm assuming it's pretend, but maybe if it, it's even a real consumer and they're asking them questions and they love the product, it's clearly an ad. Like we, it, this is not live where they've, you know, seconded some poor person just trying to do their shopping. You can tell because they all look too nice. Nice. Nobody looks that nice when they're doing their shopping. We've all got tracky decks on, and you know, like so. So you know, it's clearly an ad, and they're trying to trick us into that. And we sort of need to. What I'm hearing is apply that filter to what we put forward. Is really is this an ad? Like, are you trying to be tricky, but actually all the radar is going to go up and the the person scrolling is going to scroll straight past it because that filter will, will kick in. 
we find that boomers grew up in an era of um a very heavily scripted television ads um we generation x myself we grew up in a, in an era of radio advertising which was very formulaic in the way it approached yes. so what we've done the way we think we need to promote a product or a service is taken from an era that that really doesn't exist anymore um the, the best at this game now is generation z who they they just know what they can they can promote something but it's so much like content and so interesting that that because they're digital natives they didn't have the the benefit i guess of us growing up with terrible cinema advertising awful <laughs> local television ads even worse slice of life radio things such as Remember? hey karen i'm going off to the beach this weekend <laughs> gee i wish i had an umbrella well susan i know where you can buy an umbrella from it's from umbrellas are us like we they didn't have that kind of stuff to fall right. back on that we tend to fall back on so they've come up with new creative ways to communicate which are commercial in their very nature but are so well done that you wouldn't even know there was a product being pushed until you find yourself in the supermarket buying the product and go, why have I just bought that? Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's um, part of that, you know, that learning that over time is is why I've started to, I find myself overreacting negatively to any of the, um, any of the perfume or, you know, any of those ads because it's just so manufactured. Like it just, like the, the, it's clearly art, like credit to, all the clever creatives involved in the thing, like it's clearly art, but it in no way appeals to me at all and it doesn't connect at all. I'm waiting for somebody to do a real ad about perfume, <laughs> you know, like I'm, mm-hmm. I want to see you really understand your consumer. Now, I guess it's because that product is aspirational and you'd only have to listen to something like the Gruen and I'm sure one of them would say, but what they're trying to do is make it something you aspire to do. And it's like, yeah, but but, but probably means I don't aspire to be any of them. So, I, you know, really thinking like, an, an anti-advertiser, you know, like trying not to be that sounds like a great lesson. And for any of the listeners, if you've never watched The Gruen on ABC, yes, yeah, ABC. Um, then it's worth, it's really worth watching an, an, a couple of those episodes because they talk about this stuff in detail from the advertiser's perspective. And when you hear how clever those people are, I think it'll start to fine tune your own view of how you might post, you know, on something like Facebook, because it certainly made me more aware, that's for sure. There's a quote I came uh, across yesterday during a webinar I was watching, which was um, from a, a very uh, a very successful uh, advertising executive in, in the US that stated that um, – that social media is is more about sociology and psychology than it is about technology, and to think about that, that's that's what social media advertising, any sort of promotions and marketing is, is sociology and psychology, neurolinguistic programming, uh, various ways of trying to hypnotize people into into wanting to be interested in a product they otherwise wouldn't be interested in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Which um, yeah, explains why we all react so violently when it sort of doesn't doesn't meet that and that authenticity thing isn't met. Now, in terms of somebody who's like they're on the platform, I mean, I'm assuming most, I mean, my husband isn't, he's very proud of the fact he's not on social media, but he's one of those, he's one of those people, you know, <laughs> bless their cotton socks. But, you know, they're on there. I'm betting that, you know, if you were going to going to give them a tech tip, one of the first things you'd tell people is to protect themselves on platforms mm, like definitely. Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. I would say go in there with intent. Don't just go into, fo- into social media just because it's what everyone's doing. You go in there with intent. What do I wish to achieve by being in here? If it's to be connected to my friends who live in far off places, then realize then that there's, there's, there's a way of setting up your Facebook particular, which keeps you within that circle, but doesn't expose you to other people that you don't want to be exposed to. There's privacy settings in Facebook that allow you to post things that are only visible to your friends or to one friend or to to just a small group of friends, uh, it's when we post you know, very publicly out to everybody that we find that every Tom, Dick, and Harry that we didn't want to speak to suddenly becomes part of this conversation and we feel like our privacy is being violated and we shut down and we want to hashtag delete Facebook and we get very <laughs> shocked by it, mainly because we've gone in there with no intention. We've just gone in there blindly just, okay, I'm going to share this with my friends and we don't realize that there's so much more to that than just posting something. There, there's privacy settings, all those sort of things to do. Yeah, and you're right. I think so. Particularly if you've been on the platform for a long time, you've probably forgotten about some of that stuff. I mean, the other one that I've become really aware of is the sort of second factor authentication. You know, the, these accounts are constantly hacked, 
constantly. And so if nothing else after this podcast episode, please would you set up the second factor authentication because I'm sure, Dante, you must have, you know, horrible tales of people that haven't done that and have lost all of that hard work of connecting with the audience. Really? Every single week I'm sent at least 30 people oh. who are referred to me to try and help them. I can't help them. I don't work for Facebook directly. I'm not an employee. I'm a contracted trainer for them. Yeah. So I don't have – I have contacts within Facebook but not within – not where people can and unlock a locked account. Right. But we've got to realize that it's cybersecurity in all cases on all platforms, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Gmail, is our responsibility. It's not Google's responsibility to protect your password. Uh you have to do that. And, and the, the fact is that 97% of all cybersecurity incidents that happen on something like Facebook start with email. So if you've got a Gmail account that's got the name of your daughter plus the year of her birth as the password, which is so common, or the name of your dog and the year that of, of the, that you got them or something like that, family members, anything that could, someone could look at your desk at work and go, that's Brooke. Um, and Brooke looks like she's about, oh, about 16. So let's just say, you know, it's this year and then they, they, they come up with that. They can just reverse engineer it. Yeah. Most passwords are really poorly done. I have actually come across a client whose password was password one, two, three. Oh, no. And, it, and, and, and then they wondered why they got hacked, but I've got a password with numbers in it. And I, but it's also the single most commonly hacked password on the planet. We've been harping on about cybersecurity for 25 years now. Yeah. Surely that message has got through to you somehow, but no, because it's convenient. The same password on everything. They get into one thing, they got into everything. And it's not Facebook's responsibility to save your business page because you have poor cyber hygiene habits. Mm. It's your responsibility. And then whinging and complaining about Google not helping you out. Oh, they just hate people. They, they're they enemy of small business. That's your stupidity that did this, <laughs> not theirs. It's not their responsibility. Because the other thing is I think, you know, well, in our industry, particularly as you can imagine in finance, I mean, cyber has all sorts of of impacts and, and horrible out, potential outcomes. And so it is something that's that's really at the fore. But this is one of those things that's super easy to fix, folks. Like this is a very quick mobile number, you'll get a text message to confirm the whatever. Like that second factor of authentication stuff is super easy to do. It can, and I'm assuming that's a a massive barrier. You know, that's the thing that just sort of is the big snarling dog <laughs> in your front yard that can defend you against, you know, at least a, a significant portion of, of what somebody might try and do to get to your account. Second factor authentication will cut your cyber uh, footprint for, for hackers to be able to get you by 87%. Just that one thing, it's an 87% less chance of you ever being troubled by anyone trying to break in. Just that one thing. It's amazing. So let's do that one thing. So listeners, <laughs> you heard it here, please. You you now have homework from this pod. I'm sorry about that. I've not done that to any of you before, but you've got that homework. Please, please, please do that. I am curious, you know, and, and this is, you know, advice tech as a podcast. I'm curious on the tech element. Are there any of the tech features of Facebook that you feel don't get used much that should, like people just aren't turning on or off or applying this field? Like, is there any of that that you feel that people could dig a bit more into? I think uh, one of the most underutilized features of Facebook would happen to be the um, the business suite still. So as part of the, uh, the, the the management of, say, a business page, business suite is this tool that not only allows you to sort of see that where your business is at and run ads and things like that, but it's also a place for you to go in to see how your posts have performed. This one little place you can go and see every single post you've done. Now, why would you want to go and do that? Well, number one, see what's worked. If there's things that have worked, then you can double down and do those again and, and do the, and go, okay, that's working and, and, and fairly consistently. Do more of that. And then you can also do the opposite. See the things that aren't working and go, well, let's not waste our energy on doing that. So that's one thing that, that takes away you need to go into business page insights and it puts it in one place. The second thing is it allows you to post to both Facebook page and Instagram at the same time. Okay. So you can then put it in. You can adjust them. It gives you what we call optimal times with which you can post. In my case, it's just about always 6.30 or 7 p.m. Um, on Facebook. And the minute that I started taking that advice, my, my Facebook reach went up by about 30%. Okay. So I immediately started reaching more people. 
Unfortunately, using that time on LinkedIn was completely opposite. They, yes. they, they, I tried to do that at seven, th- 7 o'clock at night and Doesn't nobody's work. on LinkedIn. No. They, they're on Facebook in front of the TV, not LinkedIn in front of the TV. <laughs> yes. So you've got to be careful. You don't take that advice for every platform, just for Facebook and Insta. But I think That's just really- those two features alone are an efficiency relief. Yes, and I because one of the questions I did want to cover, cover which was sort of in the inter- integration category, but really it's about automation of posts or making things a bit easier. But it sounds like, you know, within the platform itself, we've already got a tool that can help with that. So, you know, for some of you who haven't yet got something that pushes out posts that you can sort of load up a whole lot of stuff, you may have it at your f- fingertips and never realized that you could just, you know, use something like the business suite. Is that valid? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, now, that in, in case it only does Facebook and Instagram, it won't do Pinterest or Twitter or sure. LinkedIn. There are other systems that I use to do that that will post yeah. out to all those different um, places. What it does do, though, it just gives you a much more in-depth look at it, recommending a time and a day to post. You can change you know, in the one place you can go, this is what I want it to say on Facebook. This is what I want it to say on Instagram. So you may have Instagram has hashtags. Facebook doesn't. You may go, I want it to be this version. Uh, you can run A, B, tests. So for instance, you can paste a, uh, have a photo with a pink background and one with a purple background and it'll test them and it'll tell you what was the most successful one. What's the one that people appealed to? So these kind of tools are just all in there. This is not really being used. Yeah. Okay. And that's really interesting because I think there's a lot about, and let's broadly call it marketing, you know, on the web and that covers all sorts of things where we get told things and we all nod, <laughs> but I think sometimes you've got to learn the hard way. So for me, I mean, I can see myself now doing, thinking about doing an A-B test where one post has a video of me talking through it with subtitles and the other one is just the words and just literally seeing for myself what difference does that make, you know, because I think we all, we all get told, you know, video is the way. Yeah, but maybe we just need to find out for ourselves. Maybe we just need to do that test. The other thing is that video is not always the best because right. I post a video post on LinkedIn and it gets nowhere near the reach of what I do if I do just a written post on LinkedIn. On mm-hmm. Facebook, on the other hand, video definitely surpasses written text as, 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 a, as a means of getting things out there. There's only one formula in social media. Everyone keeps saying, Oh, I need the tip. I need the trick. I need the, 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 the framework. It's like, no, nah, mm. there's one, there's one rule in social media. Try it. <laughs> Just try it. See if it works. If it doesn't, don't do that again. If it does work, do it again. Yeah, fantastic. That's the only rule in social media. And I think that is probably what holds, in our industry, I think what holds us back is a whole lot of investigation and analysis. I mean, I'm definitely, um, <laughs> definitely do this analysis and compare and, and then, but actually that whole time we're doing all of that, we're not posting. <laughs> so you're not connecting, you know, and it's like, Oh, doofus. You know, we've got a like better to post, like you say, even without it being perfect and be taking a look at what responds, doing the A B test. I mean, that to me is a great mission for those, you know, the listeners is is to start taking a look at those tools. They're right there. And the fact that it's embedded in the platform means I'm assuming it's super easy to use. You know, generally when they're like that, it's it's not overly complicated. It doesn't require you to do a whole lot of tricky things. Um, so that's really valuable. Yeah, I think where, where financial services particularly get very caught up is that they go, if I t- say something that's not true, I'm going to be crucified. And whilst that is true, you will be crucified. Mm. Yeah, um, the, the difference is stick to that neutral content. Don't do anything that's construed as financial advice. Don't do anything that's uh, – all the things you would not do anywhere else in your work – don't do them on social media. What you do is take the best of what you can do there, the insights, the industry insights, the the um, the case studies where you can speak of a client without identifying of a, of, of a specific circumstance you went through that doesn't identify them, make sure the privacy is intact. All the same rules you follow in every other part of your work, bring that to social media. But your personal lived experience that, that goes alongside that story, and that story is such a part of social media that really matters, uh, that's the stuff that's going to set you apart from one person taking a piece of information from Deloitte and another person taking a p- information from Deloitte. It's the story you tell with it that will make all the difference. Yeah, absolutely. And that's true of anything, any messaging. You know, it's it's the story is key. Now, I am curious about whether you've got any insight into what's down the track, you know, what's coming, what can you see evolving on a platform like Facebook? Um, you know, I'm I'm curious to ask you about Meta and the Metaverse. I'm a little afraid of <laughs> what that could dive into because I 
truly haven't had the time to invest in thinking that through. But I am curious about what you think about all of those developments and where Facebook's heading. Mm. So I think that 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 splitting between uh, what we we're talking before the social media being split more towards social networking and then uh, creator media uh, that will continue to go down that path. Okay. Now Facebook knows that creator media, um, the TikTokification of video is is great for an audience, and then they're pushing a lot of that through Facebook and Instagram at the moment. But what I think they'll find is that we'll find our thing on Facebook. Now, no matter what Facebook tries to push as forward as as a priority, we the people will find what we want to do with it. We're already mm-hmm. so invested in the platform. It's such a part of our lives, particularly mums. Mums are just so so invested in there because that's where the information from school comes from. That's where the, the play group information comes from. That's where the community groups are. That's where all her friends who are doing work from home businesses are all from as well. They're all in Facebook groups. So the, the groups part of Facebook is becoming more and more important all the time. We've now got you know paid groups that you can join. You've got paid live video that can be put on there. So if you want to connect with people who are in a business sense, you can do that. Um, that return to – we've already seen uh, two, two major returns come to Facebook, which are uh, taking us back, to, back, in, back in time, is that the, the business page is, 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 is back. Suddenly, business pages are getting a little bit more reach than what they were. Now, not mm-hmm. every page, not every post. What we're finding is that really well put together, um, relevant storytelling posts that, 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 that hit an emotional – need or they, they, they answer a question, they're, they're generally helpful, things that are helpful to other people. Those things are starting to get just a little bit more reach again. They're yeah, coming okay. back again. So there's a swing back to that quality content again. And what we're seeing too is the splitting of the feeds that's coming to Facebook very shortly where there's going to be a feed, which is um, it's, it's called like a discovery feed. So here's the things we know you know and love, but we're going to throw in there things that we think you're going to be loving next. Okay. So you're going to see a bit like um, on Instagram right now. Mm-hmm. You're not just mm-hmm. seeing the stuff you're following. You're, f- you're seeing even more interesting stuff Things that you're probably like, going to be interested yeah, in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and so of course, most of that content is going to be reels and video. Yep. So get ready for that because that's coming. But then there'll also be another feed which you can switch to, which is the chronological feed. And the chronological okay. feed is everything. It's the fire hose that's yep. coming down. So you can switch between them. It'll always default back to the discovery feed because that's where all the good stuff is. Mm-hmm. I'm already on that particular version of Facebook now. And I can tell you what, I, I switched back to the chronological feed once and I got back off it again because it was so boring. <laughs> I wanted to go back to the discovery feed because it had all the interesting stuff on there. It's like it took out all that boring stuff for the people who I know and love. God bless them that they're boring. <laughs> I don't want to see their stuff. And it brought me all the stuff I really do want to see. So that's that's sort of what you're going to see a lot more of Instagram and Facebook particularly. And I and- think your point there is is why groups work so well because I, so I'm actually in a in a couple of groups that are uh, author groups. So it's for people who love a particular author's books. Now and they were clearly all started by the people who love the books, not the author. Most of them, right? And these people are insane. It's fantastic. And because there's so many of them in the group, the feed can be quite like there's a lot of variety. There's themes and there's a tone. But to be honest, it's it's really interesting how supportive these strangers are with each other because they've got that connected thing they love, you know? And so that's another example of that. Well, I don't know them directly, but because I'm in that group, you know, I'm going to be a part of all of that information, all those posts. And so, yeah, there's a, there's probably a shift the way we need to consider connection too. You know, it's not necessarily one-to-one as much as, much as shared interest, you know, or affinities. Or, yeah, affinities, absolutely. And as, and as I and my fellow car carrying members of the Kath and Kim Appreciation Society can attest, <laughs> yes. we've got friends and relationships who are developed in there over a number of years now of people who we just share this common love of Kath and Kim. Yeah. And and that has made us all very united and we spot Kath and Kimisms in everyday life and we bring that into the group and it makes us smile, it makes us laugh. And because of all that and the way we interact, it comes up a lot on our feeds. So we're yeah. constantly then doing that. And I think that, that group factor, it's been the great success story of Facebook has been groups and messenger. They've been yeah. the two things that have really been the big successes of Facebook. Fantastic. And and your how do you feel about metaverse? Are you are you the in the metaverse? Is, have you 
So the, no, I'm not yet. I'm not yet, but okay. um, I've seen the whispers of the next uh, Oculus, or not? They call it not Oculus Quest. It's going to be called MetaQuest, MetaQuest Pro. So I, I recently was in Sydney for training with Facebook, and we got to play with the MetaQuest uh, the headset, uh, yep. MetaQuest Two. And I particularly the app that I chose to go to was the National Geographic app that took you to Machu Picchu. And so you're in Machu Picchu, and you're immersed in this environment, looking around. There's butterflies going by, and you're actually following things. And there's a bird swoops down. You follow it, and like, and then you look over the edge, and you get the vertigo you would get if you were looking over a cliff edge. And it's like, whoa, okay. So the difference was now everything I wanted to do was screaming into me to walk forward. Mm. And you've got limitations in physical space that you can walk mm. forward, but you literally feel like you can walk forward. The platform teaches you more about using upper body because you're using controllers. Right. So the interact, pick things up and throw them in the metaverse. So um, you're, you're able to interact with your environment so much more than if you were just watching it on a screen. That to me was a killer feature and I will be buying the next iteration of the of the Meta Quest goggles um, when they come out in, I think, October, late October they're coming out. Okay. So I've, I put aside money. I'm going to buy. I don't know how much they're going to be, but they're going to be in my room. Um, Fantastic. I'm going to, because I've now looked at it, experienced it and gone, it's now ready to be something of interest to me. The metaverse itself in terms of, um, if anyone's seen the, the movie Ready Player One, it's kind of like the, mm-hmm. that's the nth degree of what the, the metaverse can be. It's, it's an alternative world where you can interact. You can be educated in there. It doesn't matter where you are. You can access whatever you want. And in an interactive in- environment, which is all sensory, they're in suits, body suits, which have got haptic feedback. You feel things, you feel pain, you feel pleasure. So okay. that kind of thing, that's, that's a decade or more away. Okay. That, that sort of stuff doesn't exist yet. And it's, it's, people are thinking that, that Facebook is building the metaverse and that's not the case at all. Uh, it's you and I will build the metaverse. So it won't be something which is appropriate for us to be putting our businesses on and, and, and doing our webinars on until it's as easy as setting up a Facebook page. Once right. the tools are built that help us to enable our presences in that metaverse, that's when it becomes a significant part. Don't expect any of that for the next few years. Like there's three to five years away before we really start to look at that and go, now I see some value in this thing. For now, it's early adopters and people who like to, to play virtual games. Yeah. I guess though, you know, for people, particularly probably with your own business, then the thing they could be doing is just experiencing it, you know, getting the, like actually just going in as a user. So you understand from a user perspective, perspective for the next few years, um, because, uh, and really think about what that experience is like. I mean, the National Ge- Geographic example is perfect. They have enhanced your experience from you being in your living room into you being <laughs> Machu Picchu. Like that's an enhanced experience. I think the struggle we have in finance is often what we try and do with things, and let's call it virtual reality for want of a better expression, is we create exactly the same dull experience in virtual reality. No, 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 no. This is meant to be outside your world. This is meant to be beyond something you could imagine, you know. So just making it 3D is not is not what these tools are for. So maybe just using them and really sort of thinking that through, it, like really analysing your own experience of something like that, I think is the way for us to be ready down the track, you know, when maybe it'll be something we can participate in. I'll pull it back to something even more simple. Um, Today, create your Facebook pages, interact on your Facebook groups, create content for, for Instagram. All those things will have a pathway that goes across to the metaverse. So there will be the equivalent of a Facebook page in the metaverse. There will be a a Facebook group equivalent in the metaverse. Those things will lead to each other. So if you're doing it with the today's tools, double down on today's tools because there will be pathways and migration paths that take it from the flat screen experience to the immersive experience. So get today's tools right, participate in today's economy, then, then you'll be ready to participate in tomorrow's. I love it. Is there anything we've missed? Is there some gems that we should have covered? Well, I think we've covered the metaverse, which is pretty a big I one know, to right? have to cover. That's the one which I get a lot of questions about, but people still walk away and go, I still don't know what you're talking about. Um, I'd say then the other thing would be to um, messaging is the great other area. And I think when okay. it comes to customer service, when it comes to um, dealing with clients and secure protocols, things like WhatsApp, which is an encrypted end-to-end chat service, 
those things, be ready for the fact that not all of your clients are going to want to come and see you. Not all of your clients are necessarily going to want to hop on a Zoom call. Um, they may want to deal with you where they're at. And if that happens to be in a Facebook page, they want to be able to contact you and call you through your Facebook page. Allow them to do that. I don't think we, um, I don't think we do anyone any favors when we force people into our funnels. We force <laughs> people into the way that we want to be contacted with, yeah. particularly if you're a customer centric organization. Let people contact you the way they want to contact you. Not, yeah. not this whole like, oh, I can't stand email because I'm on the job site and I can't do the email. Too bad, mate. Yeah, get yeah. a better way of dealing with it because people will not contact you if they can't contact you the way that they want to contact you. That's natural to them. And all that means, folks, is is putting up the you know procedures in place for your business that handles those as they come in. That's all it is. It's just it's just like having somebody that make you make sure answers the phone. It's just another phone, you know, and sort of viewing it that way and having a procedure, having somebody that looks after it. Um, you know, it's just another another channel. Well, that's been fantastic. Thank you so much, Dante. If you'd like to find out more about this wonderful gentleman and how he can assist uh, assist you in particularly, you, you know, your small business, then we're going to include his website link in the show notes. Dante's got a great weekly um, email that he sends out that's got all sorts of useful nuggets in it. So I'd encourage you to subscribe for that. We'll also include his LinkedIn profile um, in the show notes. Uh, and Thank you so much. I think we've covered all sorts of things. And don't forget, folks, second factor authentication, please go and do that immediately on your Facebook account. You will thank us later. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. I really appreciate the uh, the chance to sort of bring this to a new audience I normally wouldn't reach. So thank you so much to those who do tune in and, and, and get that advice. But yes, yeah, second factor authentication. <laughs> Just do that one thing and you'll be, you know, an, an, another angel will be given their wings. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you use Facebook from a professional perspective? You know, or are you one of those people that sort of keeps it only for personal uh, interactions? You know, is there some of what we talked about today that sort of prompted some thoughts or maybe you disagree entirely? No matter what you think, please share your insights on the XY platform as, you know, I'd love to hear your take. We all have different perspectives on these things. And of course, anything that you've experienced in the way you've posted on Facebook or the way you've utilized the tool is always going to be helpful to your um, fellow advisors and, and bionic advisors. Now, in terms of my thoughts, now you've heard us say it a couple of times, but you know what? I'm going to say it again. Please, 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 pretty please. Set up that second factor authentication on your socials. Do it the minute you turn, you finish this episode. Please get, just get that set up. Um, it's a way to both protect you from being hacked, but also protect your audience or, or your community from hearing from somebody that isn't you. And there's nothing more distressing than that. So please do that. The other thing I'd say is that we sort of need to, sometimes we need to shift the lens we have over something. I, I think, you know, Facebook can be viewed as something that's old school, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not the up and coming thing. And, and that's probably correct. But, you know, as Dante was saying, it's still used a lot. And for certain people, it's deeply used. I mean, their whole life can be an interaction through Facebook. So, you know, sometimes we need to change the lens over something and understand where our clients or the clients we're looking for where they might be living. And for many of them, that will be Facebook. And don't underrate the older um, demographic. Lots of them are on Facebook because that's how they connect with their grandkids. So so please, you know, change, take that lens off. Don't make an assumption that you know. Um, as Dante says, experiment a little um, and really think about, you know, the way you can connect on a tool like this, you know, make it fun, make it interesting, um, share a bit of yourself, you know, sure, curate something that's from our industry, but give it your take, give it your sense of humor or, or give it, you know, a lens through maybe you, the way your kids would think about this or the way your partner or your best mate who's, you know, maybe like me, you know, my husband's a carpenter. What would he think of that report? You know, so let's give, you know, some humanity back to the way that we talk about what we do um, and the help that we give the public. Now, you know, I often get asked what it takes to become a bionic advisor or at least to be sort of as immersed in tech and what's out there as, you know, I am. And I give the same answer every time. It's just curiosity. We've just got to be curious. Um, and Dante reinforced this. Give it a try. 
just see what you can do. So to really develop those curiosity muscles a little bit further, as you know, if you've been listening to the pod for a little while, um, each week I'm going to bring up just a little groovy app that I think or or website that I think you could, could take a look at. Give it a bit of a looky-loo um, and see if it prompts any thoughts for you. Now, for this week's Curiosity Corner, I'd love you to check out Answer the Public. You can find it at answerthepublic.com. Now, their tagline is discover what people are asking about online. Now, this is really interesting. This website listens into autocomplete data from search engines like Google, meaning when you type in, as you start typing into Google, you'll notice it sort of try and preempts what you're going to um, fill out. And that's based on what other people have searched. So it listens to that and then quickly cranks out, you know, every useful phrase and, and question people are asking around a particular keyword you give it, right? This is a gold mine of consumer insight, right? You can get, you can start to create fresh, really ultra useful content. And remember, that's what we've got to try and do more of on whether it's a product or a service or anything you're doing. Um, and it'll be on a topic that the customers really want, right? Now, you know, there's something like, I don't know, 3 billion Google searches every day. But interestingly, 20% of those have never been seen before. So this sort of tool is like a sort of direct line to what your customers are thinking. So I went on the tool, Answer the Public dot com and just typed in as a keyword or words life insurance now what's interesting is it gives you over 200 phrases that appear now you know one of the phrases was are life insurance policies worth it another popular one was life insurance for mums right or life insurance versus savings accounts so this is what people are literally googling to find out more about life insurance so instead of wondering what people want We could just start with what they're already asking for, you know, pick your topic of interest or your niche, and you could come up with a massive list of content ideas just from a free tool like Answer the Public. So check it out, and I'd love to know what you think. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you'd like a speaker at your next event to brief your audience on the seven habits of bionic advisors and the secrets to tech-powered, human-centric advice, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn forward slash PeterMD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. And if you think you'd love to have me speak at an event you attend, then please feel free um, to let me know and I'll happily reach out to them and see if they'd love to have me come and present on the habits of bionic advisors otherwise i'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week and remember advice explorers stay curious